Today is one of my favorite days of the year. In fact, it is the favorite day of the year. Uh, I know if I ask you the question, what is your favorite day of the year? Uh, some people would say like my birthday, obviously, or Christmas where we get a lot of gifts and things like that. And then some, somebody who's been to church goes, oh, and remember that Jesus was born. So that's a good day, right? Well, today is the day is the most awesome day of all because it is Easter. It is the day that we remember and celebrate that Jesus Christ rose from the dead right on Friday he was crucified on Saturday he was in the tomb on Sunday the the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty because Jesus rose from the dead and because of that this is a day that changes everything The rising of the sun. I've had so many people ask me this morning as I was going around visiting with you and welcoming you all and and glad you're here and celebrating with you. How did the Easter sunrise service? I said, not only did we get a sunrise service in this morning, we baptized them all. (laughs) We got about three quarters away through the message and then I had to hurry up and finish the last part as the Lord was bringing the rains and the, and the sprinkling and, and it's just that constant reminder of, of the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, how many of you just ordinarily like change? That's what I thought. Three, four. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there's some time. There are just some people like, hey, I'm up for anything. Yeah, let's do it. Let's mix it up. Let's change some things. But for the most part, we don't like change. How many of you are sitting in your seat? Yeah, right, it's like, because I can't sit somewhere else because A, I like this seat, or it wouldn't be my seat, but I know if I sit somewhere else, I'm sitting in somebody else's seat. We're all creatures of habit. And we don't like change for one reason, that we have fear that whatever the new thing is, it's not going to be as good as the last one. I, I told the sunrise service, and you, some of you may have heard this one before, but, but as, as Methodist pastors, we are itinerant, meaning we're here from one year, we could be here, and then could be a couple of years, but then sometimes we're sent other places. And a pastor was getting ready to leave one congregation. He'd been called and appointed to another congregation. And, and so he let him know that it was, it was going to be his last Sunday with them. <clears throat> and a lady came up after the service and she was so upset and said, Pastor, I can't believe they're, they're moving another one of my favorite pastors. And he said, honey, that's okay. That's the way it works. And besides, they'll probably send somebody even better the next time and she wailed that's what they said last time <laughs> right? yeah we're afraid that things won't get better we're th- afraid that our situation will actually get and so we don't want anything to change but do you not know from the instant you were conceived you have constantly been changing And we don't have to worry about all the change anymore. And one of the greatest fears that we have changing is going from living in these bodies to death. Can I get an amen? Right? There's a lot of people that are worried about that. But because of Easter, because of this day, because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we don't even have to be afraid of death. He has already told us that he's going to prepare a place for us and that when it's time, he'll come back for us and take us to be with him so that we don't have to be afraid of anything. This day, Easter, is a day of absolute change, but we don't have to be afraid because Jesus is even Lord over death itself. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to take a look at the resurrection story in the Gospel of Matthew. It's uh, chapter 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance, by the way, I've heard somebody suggest that this stone, um, they were usually about this tall and probably about a foot thick, and there was a little trough that the, they would roll over in front of a, a cave that has been hewn out, and, and, and so that they could roll it back, put the new bodies in, and then they would roll it back, and they would seal it up until the next time. 
Well, an angel came of the Lord and he rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Uh, became like dead men. That's a euphemism for they just flat out, they, they fainted. They just straight out, right? They couldn't handle it. It was an angel of the Lord. They didn't know what to do with it. Their minds weren't prepared for that. And so they just fainted dead away. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble." And so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. And then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. So we're going to take a look at a couple of things here. And um, the first point that I want to make this morning, if you're, if you're making notes and want to write down some points here, the first one is the resurrection is not up for debate. Oh, there, were, there, oh, there will be people who will want to debate you. But you need to listen to this. The resurrection is a fact attested to by scripture, tradition, history, geography, and even medical science. One time atheist Lee Strobel admits that while looking for all the facts, he began to look at it. Some of you know this story in the case for Christ that, that Lee Strobel had been married and, and he was a newspaper reporter. He was also a lawyer and his wife started at the invitation of a friend started going to church. And he looked at her like, you're an idiot. Why would you go to church? You know, you have a college degree. You don't have to be like all those other people. And she said, all I know is I need something else in my life. And so I'm going to go. Well, that made him even matter. And so as a lawyer, he put Christ on trial. And he went around and he added up all the facts in a two-year journey, talking to atheists, talking to pastors, talking to, to preachers and teachers, and, and asking questions of anybody and everybody, and then weighed all the facts together. And some of you know that he said, the only thing I could do when I put all the facts together was to get down on my knees and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 reports that over 500 people, 500, 500 people saw Jesus alive over a period of 40 days after the resurrection. 
Uh, there's all kind of other theories. He fainted, he swooned, he didn't really die. That's where I said the medical sciences come in because most of you know that scripture reports that when they went to get Jesus off the cross, because they had to take him down, and before they went to take him down, they wanted to make sure that he was dead. And they saw that he was dead, but just to make sure, they reached a, took a spear and speared him into the side. And the scripture, which would not have known this medically back then, says that, and what came out was blood and, wa blood and water. Well, the doctors will tell you that's exactly what happens to you at death, is it begins to separate. So we know without a shadow of a doubt, not only did 500 people see him, but we know that he was speared in the side and his blood had already separated. He was seriously dead on the cross. When they whipped him and they beat him, they beat him with an inch of his life. If that wasn't enough to kill him, then they nailed him. Then they put him up on a cross and then he let him hang there. Now, if you don't know this, crucifixion is a horrible way to die because what you eventually do is they, they nail your hands, they nail your feet. And what you will want to do, because you want to live, the strive and the will to live, is you want to keep pushing up with your feet. And it will help you relax your lungs, get one more breath, one more breath, one more breath. The two thieves on the cross on either side of them were not dead yet. And as was their custom, they took large hammers and broke their legs so they could not push up anymore. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. The scripture tells, tells us that he gave up his life. He let it go. He was already dead. But just to make sure, they speared him in the side. So we know he was really dead. And then we know he really rose again. He revealed himself to the women at the tomb. He revealed himself to all of his disciples. And then again later to over 500 people all at the same time. And Paul even reports, many of those people are still alive today. So you can go and talk to them. You can go and ask them for yourselves. So the facts are in. Is it, if it's so obvious, then why are there still atheists? The same reason that they didn't believe then, they don't believe today. They don't want to they don't want it to be true. Matthew tells us that the soldiers reported, and this is one of the amazing things to me. So the chief priests, the priests of the temple are supposed to be the priests of the one true living God. And they have been told, prophesied through scripture for over 800 years about the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. And yet, because they were so close-minded, they couldn't even see him when he was right in front of them. And then even after they crucified him, even after they saw everything, the, the curtain was torn in two, there was a great earthquake. It even says that the dead people who, who were dead in the Lord came alive and went into town and started witnessing to everybody. I mean, can you imagine all of this? And all of, I, I can just imagine the chief priests were like this, nope, 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 we can't, we can't see him we can't, because it's gonna mess up everything we think and everything we believe. You know, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts and when the guards came to the chief priests right they're supposed to be the people of God the highest level of the people of God the chief priests of Jerusalem they made a deal with them and said yeah don't worry about it do you know what the penalty is for a guard to lose a prisoner back then death and they said not only are we going to not take your life we're going to pay you off and you just tell them while you were asleep. Now, well, asleep doesn't work because they would kill them anyway, right? It doesn't work. And yet they said, you go out. And if word ever gets to the governor, we got your back. You just go out and spread this lie. It's not that they can't see it. It's not that they can't believe. It's because they don't want to. They don't want it to be true. Author and evangelist Ray Comfort says, you can lead an atheist to facts, but you can't make them think. He argues that a building is a sign of an architect, a painting the sign of a painter, and a creation the sign of a creator. 
It's not that atheists can't believe, it's that they don't want to. One day he tells of seeing an atheist who was wearing a, what some people might think is a cute or even a funny shirt, and it said, so many Christians, so few lions. Yeah, that deserves a, ooh. You know, yeah, I, I have a sense of humor. I can laugh at that a little bit. But you know what? You know what it really is? If you think about it, it's saying we not only hate God, we hate all the people of God, and we wish they were all dead and that they would be destroyed and eaten by lions. That's how bad we hate them. Do you know what that's called? That's called hate speech, right? Where's the ACLU when you need them? Why is this t-shirt okay? But it's because they're so annoyed. They're so angry. Ray goes on to say this. He said, atheists don't hate fairies, leprechauns, or unicorns because they don't exist. The only reason they hate God is because he does exist. We have a story in scripture found in the gospel of Luke of, that Jesus tells about the prodigal son. And if you don't know the story, is a father who had two sons and the younger one wasn't gonna get as much as the older one, but he didn't wanna wait around anymore. He's gonna get the ranch, I'm not gonna get much, but, but you know what? I just want what's coming to me. I'm not gonna sit around here and work for him and work for you and, and then I don't know how old I'll be when you die. So basically he went to his father and said, I wish you were dead already. Please sell my half of the ranch, my portion of it, and give me all the money that I can go and live the life that I wanted to. Now, here's another miracle. The father actually did it. He said, fine, you don't want anything to do with us. You don't want anything to do with the ranch anymore. I'm going to give you your share of the money. Here it is. Go be well. Now, what does it say that the son did? He went as far away from the father as he possibly could. Not because he didn't believe the father existed, but because he did. And he didn't want his father constantly looking over his shoulder. We know that the son went out and he spent all of his money on wine and women and songs. And there's a country song that says, the senoritas don't caro when there's no more dinero. When, when, when the money's all gone, these people you thought were your friends, they're not your friends anymore. They've gone on, they've moved on, and, and they found other friends. And this son found himself so far away from home, the only job. Now remember this, a Jew wasn't supposed to have anything to do with pigs or pork, right? No bacon. And yet he ended up in a pigsty. That was as far away as he could. Not because he didn't believe his father didn't exist. He knew that he did. And he didn't want him sitting in judgment. There are so many people today who don't want God to be true. But do you know this? It takes more faith to be an atheist than to be a Christian. A lot of Christians don't know that. They're like, what? It's like, yeah, right? Because if, if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, there's not an infinite number of irreducible causes. So, so if, you, if you say, okay, to an atheist, well, what brought life here? You know what the atheists are going through Darwinism and all that kind of stuff? The only answer they have is that the planet, the, 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 the universe just happened there was just a big explosion. Well, you have to ask, then what caused the explosion? Explosion. Well, and then they come up with something else, and then you say, well, what exploded it? If every action has an equal opposite reaction, then something had to act upon it for it to, they, they can't handle it, their minds just explode. But they say, well, it, it just happened. It just, I don't know how to, it just happened. It just exploded, and then we're spinning here, and then somehow we got hit by a piece of another planet, a comet, and it landed in one of our oceans or our lakes, and, and this goo, this ooze. Okay. You know what he's saying? He believes in UFOs. 
Life forms from another planet came and formed life here on earth. Now, I'm not for or against UFOs. My God's a mighty God. If he wants aliens to be out there, they can be out there. It doesn't bother me either way. But what I'm saying is, no, when you back them up, they can't come up with anything. When you start talking about Christianity, and I know a lot of you are into apologetics, and, and it's a reason, it's a defense of the faith, and we actually have more facts on our side. It actually takes less faith to be a Christian than it does to be an atheist who said, well, it all just happened. I don't know. I don't understand. We come from nothing. We go to nothing. They are afraid that if God is real, then they will be held accountable that they will be judged. Do you know how many sins it takes to send you to hell? One. Do you know how many sinners there are in the world? All. We're all the same. We're all in the same boat. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you think more people at the end of it all And the eschaton, which we've been talking about, the final triumph of good over evil. How many of you think there will be more in heaven than hell? Anybody bold enough? We had a lot of bold ones at the early service. They all get up early. All right, let me ask it the other way. How many of you believe there will be more in hell than in heaven? A lot more hands. You've been here at this church and you've heard this before. And it doesn't come from me. It comes from Jesus. If you ask the average person, where are you going to be when you die? Well, then, well, heaven, because I'm a good person. Oh, are you? Have you ever told a lie? I mean, just even a little spot. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're a liar. Have you, ever, have you ever stolen anything? Oh, a piece of bubble gum? You know, it's just a little bit. Have you ever committed adultery? Well, yeah, but it was just a little woman. <laughs> hey, you know, they, they always try to rationalize. It's like, well, I'm, I, there's a lot worse people here than me, so why are you coming down on me? It says one sin is all it takes. So therefore, what is the penalty for the sin for all of us? And where would we be headed? The natural uh, understanding is that we're all headed to hell. All separated from God. But the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that he loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son into the world to live in the world, to teach them about him, to demonstrate his love, and to die on the cross for them so that on the third day he could be rose from the dead. And we don't know, we don't totally get it or understand, we don't have to know how it works. How many of you are major mechanics? And yet you got in your car this morning, it started up and drove you here, and you don't know how. We don't know, understand how it all works, but we believe it because God says, here's how it works. I sent my one and only perfect son, the only one perfect who would ever live, to die on the cross for your sin. And everyone, that means all y'all, anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, We'll be saved forever. We'll be invited into his great heaven above. But everybody else, and you need to hear this, there are more people going to be in hell. That's not me. That's Jesus. And he said, the way is narrow and few will find it. I fear that there are some people who are lukewarm. If you're not sure, read the first couple chapters of Revelation, even the churches of Jesus Christ, post-resurrection, didn't get it all right. And to one of the churches, he says, ah, I wish you were hot or cold as it is. You're lukewarm. And I'm about to spit you out of his mouth, my mouth. Jesus 
doesn't want any lukewarm Christians. <laughs> you know, sometimes we as pastors, we do that. All you have to do is just believe, just believe, just believe. And everybody goes, well, I, I believe. <laughs> well, good. I must be okay. It's like, no. And, and we try to make it easy. Well, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do it. Yeah, you do. You, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. There's too many people that want him to be Savior, but not Lord. Because they don't want him looking over their shoulder. They don't want him telling them what to do. I used the illustration Friday night of getting off of a boat. You got one foot on the dock, one foot on the boat. <laughs> Anybody ever been there before? Right? And, and it gets farther and farther away where, where you, you're going to have to make a choice. I'm either going this way or I'm going that way, but I got to do something. I can't stay here in the middle. And that's what Jesus is saying to all of us is you can't just be lukewarm. You can't just believe. You know how much Jesus requires? He requires everything, everything. We know of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and, and he said, what must I do to have eternal life? And, and Jesus said, well, you got to do a couple of these things, these commands. And he said, well, I'm already doing that. I'm, a, I'm in gold. And Jesus said, well, I got this one other thing against you. Go sell everything. Everything? Go sell everything. Give it to the poor. You don't need it where you're going. And then just come and follow me. And the word says the rich young ruler went away sad. Where was his real faith? His real faith was in power. His real faith was in money. His real faith was in this world. And he wanted just enough of Jesus to keep him out of hell. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, it requires everything. You lay down your life Pick up your cross. You know what a cross is? It's a method for crucifixion of death. What are we dying to? We're dying to ourselves. And here's something that's important. The second point this morning is true faith requires an open heart. Jesus really did not spend a lot of time arguing with those who did not believe in him. In fact, Mark tells us that he was going around and he was doing all these signs and he was doing all these miracles and then the crowds just kept getting bigger and bigger. And boy, you can imagine his disciples going, oh yeah, now we're getting it. Now, now boy, the momentum's really going. And Jesus gets the microphone, which is funny because there wasn't microphones back then. But Jesus finally has an opportunity to address more people. The disciples had to be excited. And then all he did was tell a story, a parable about some farmer and some seeds and some dirt. And then he dropped the mic, boom, walked off and said, he that has ears, let him hear. And most of the people walked away going, that guy's an idiot. I, man, he's got great power. I've got to give it to you for that one. But his preaching, it needs some work. He's still new at it, right? And then, and this is important. When all the people, everyone was confused. Sometimes people say, well, the parables were told so that we could really understand it. No, Jesus flat out tells you, I speak in parables to confuse them. That doesn't register with us. Don't you want them to get it? Don't you want it? He goes, man, only those who have ears, only those who are interested, only those who have open hearts. And so when you imagine when all the crowds are just dispersing because this guy's a lunatic, we thought he was somebody, but he's really nothing. All he did was tell a story about some dirt. What? And then the disciples, you can imagine, they're just following after Jesus and they're looking at each other. I'm not gonna ask him, you ask him, you. No, no, I don't, because we, we don't get it. We don't understand. And finally, one of them brave enough said, hey, Jesus, can you possibly explain what just happened there? And he looked at him in the eye. 
And he said, because you followed me, to you belongs the treasures of the kingdom. If you want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you can't just believe. You have to accept him for all that he is. You have to be willing to lay down your life. You have to be willing to put him first, number one. And you have to be willing to follow him. Do the things that he did. Love the things that he loved. Hate the things that he hated. True faith requires an open heart. But here's the promise of Jesus. All who seek will find. Now, I've told this my church, if you guys, I know we got some visitors here today, and, and uh, some of you may have forgotten, and I think it's been a couple of years since I told you this story. A young man came to a priest, and he was looking for God. He, he tried the worldly things, and he, and he found it wanting, and, and, and so he, he came to the priest, and he said, I, I think I need to be baptized. Why? He says, well, I'm looking for God. I can't find him anywhere. And the Greek priest finally agrees, and, the, and he went out to the local lake there, and he took him down, and he went all the way in. It was a full immersion, a dunk him till you bubble, right? And so he, he put him under the water, put his hand on top of his head, and said, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit but he forgot to let him up and the young man began struggling and so a little bit louder the priest said I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and now the guy's really shaking under the water and the pastor is just holding on to him and screaming I baptize you in the name of the finally the guy shot out of the water and he said what are you doing and he looked at him and he said, son, when you seek God as desperately as you sought air, you will find him. So many people are blinded. They're deceived. It's not that they can't see. It's because they don't want to see for all those who are sincere with an open heart readily accept the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and follow him no matter what it takes. Number three is true faith requires change and I know I'm gonna speed this up. For all who consider themselves Christians, I wanna ask you the question, what changed? What would change if you suddenly just found out? Uh, I asked, you know, this question was asked of me in seminary, and, you know, I'm pretty gullible. I just go, go along with everything. And I said, what if they found the bones of Jesus? Suddenly they were doing this archaeological dig, and they could prove with DNA that it's actually Jesus. How would it affect your faith? And I'm in the back of the room going, not at all. I just figure there's going to be another answer, another explanation. I just, I just believe, I just believe. And he said, no. No, if Jesus was not resurrected bodily from the dead, then our faith is in vain. We're, we're doing all this for nothing. It's, it's what many people think it is. It's a fable, it's a fairy tale, and it's not true. But in order to be a true Christian, you have to be transformed. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. We were all born of a mama and a daddy. We were born in the flesh, but we must be born in the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes into you, it's like, woo! suddenly you become alive. Suddenly church isn't a bore anymore. Suddenly it's not a drag anymore. I God bless you. I know some of y'all have a drug problem. You got drug here to church this morning and you're just hanging in. When, how long does this go? Man, we work on Kairos time here because God is working. Jesus is working. And we're blaming the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't like it, you're not saved. 
And, 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 I, and that's a bold statement, but it's like anywhere we go, if we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's like hallelujah, praise God, keep on, preach it brother, keep going. It requires a change in us. Too many Christians say, well, there's never been a change. I've been a Christian my whole life. And so, but I wanna think, what would it be like? What would you do differently? How would you think differently? And they say, well, I don't really know. I have thought about it. You know what I would do? Number one, I would have a different job, okay? I would be making a lot more money doing something else. I would have a boat, I would have a truck, I would have a car, I would have a motorcycle, I would have all the toys, I would have a bigger house, I would not be spending time in here, I would be spending time out there, I'm going fishing, right? I would have a lot more, same wife, same wife, I just want to just, just say. Same wife, but we'd have a lot more money and we'd travel. Why don't we do those things? Why don't we have those things? Because we're called to not live for those kinds of things. We have invested everything for the cause and the purpose of Jesus Christ. But if they find the bones, and so something has changed in us to say, yes, God, we will put you first. And I pray that that's something that's happened to you as well. well I want you to pay attention to the scriptures. Peter changed. Thomas changed. The disciples on the road to Emmaus changed. James, his own brother. I like this. One pastor said one time, what would it take your brother to convince you that he is the Christ? And you're like, I know my brother. Man, <laughs> there ain't no way. James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. What changed for all of them? They saw the resurrected Lord. At the cross, they scattered, but on Pentecost, they gathered. In Acts, Peter, who ran away and denied Christ before the cross, stood up before the people, and he said, you are the ones who killed him. You crucified him. And you need to know he's back. They're cut to the heart. This is, it's not a head problem. It's not a fact problem. It's a heart problem. They were cut to the heart and said, what must we do? And Peter gave these words, you must be repent and be baptism. You be baptized. You know what baptism is? It's going down in death it's giving him everything and it's being raised to new life if you are truly a Christian then you have to be changed you must be born again you must be transformed heaven is not the goal being Christ like is the goal and we need to be transformed everything must change when we humble ourselves and accept Jesus as Lord, the Holy Spirit fills us with love, joy. <laughs> Here's a spiritual mirror. How am I doing in my faith? The gifts of the Spirit, Galatians chapter five. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you are a person that exudes love and joy and patience. Somebody said, ruh -roh. Amen? And, and it's not just simply trying harder. It's saying, I need to be changed. It's a mirror that's holding up saying, I've got to do better. But Jesus, I've tried it on my own. I can't. I need you, Holy Spirit, to come in my life, to change me, to transform me, so that I will be more like you with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And then if we will all do that, then we will be set on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, then finally, number four, and we're wrapping up here, true faith requires, requires a response. 
There are so many Christians today that said, well, Jesus ought to be just happy if I show up to church. If I go to, to a Sunday school, I want some extra credit for that. They're like, no, do you not know you are supposed to be filled with his spirit. You are to be light and salt in the world. I love it and we should probably do it. I've heard of churches that have this, a big banner going out and it says you're going out into the mission field. Some of you don't want to be missionaries. You are missionaries. The question, for whose team, right? Are you bringing more people to Christ or are you sending more people merrily on their way to hell? We are supposed to be so filled with the Spirit that we would go out and we would be different and we would be transformed and our neighbors would look at us and go, what? Why are you doing all those things? Why are you going to church? Why are you so not? Why aren't you mad at the president? Why aren't you mad about all these things? Why about all the stuff? Why? And, and none of it bothers you. It's like, no, man, it used to. But let me tell you about what my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, has done for me. You don't have to deal with that anymore. You can, you can put it to rest. Just do what I did. Get down on your knees. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're an atheist, God bless. If you're lukewarm, confess. If you're on fire, express. Be salt and light in the world. And sharing your faith for he is risen. risen Took you a while. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. How about a hand clap of praise and celebration? Amen. Let us pray. God, as we come before you in this day, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this greatest day of all day because it's the reminder of the celebration and we get to come here and we get to worship you. God, you created us out of love for love. It's not that you're mad at us. It's because you love us. You don't want us to do things that hurt us. And, and so you tell us the right way to live. But also, Father, you have offered your one and only son as that once and for all perfect sacrifice that whosoever believes believes in him, puts their faith and trust in him, invites the Holy Spirit and will be transformed and will become your disciples who will follow you anywhere you lead from this day forward. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for those who haven't gotten it yet, who don't understand. But Lord, I pray if there's just even an opening there that your Holy Spirit would take over and lead them to a living, breathing fire. And Lord, I pray for this church I pray for your Holy Spirit to be here. I pray for your fire. And Lord, I pray for us as we prepare to go from this place, we already give you thanks for the lunch we're all about to enjoy and for the celebration of being with family forevermore. But Lord, also gift us with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit that we would be people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness so that other people might see your love living in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody, the Lord said, amen.